So I'm going to share with you um, today some um, uh, reflections on uh, misunderstandings, um, uh, counter, which I've called countercultural misunderstandings, uh, alternative art exhibitions, and uh, Cold War politics. Uh, my paper concerns misunderstandings among representatives of different strands of the international alternative art scene in the late Cold War. Um, and I'm going to be working outwards from one instance of Western feedback um, on the politics of Eastern art. Uh, by the early 1980s, many members of the Moscow conceptualist circle had made one-way journeys to New York, nourishing ambitions to develop their careers and to participate in the international art world. Boris Groys recalls that unofficial life in the Soviet Union was inevitably unfulfilling for its most ambitious artists in spite of its remarkable day-to-day -day functionality. It could not deliver the external feedback that Moscow conceptualists uh, craved. He writes, Russian intellectuals or artists built the networks and circles and black markets that are present in all the major cities of the country. One could live and survive in these networks without having any need to deal with anything Soviet. The majority of unofficial artists at that time were satisfied with this lifestyle. Only the circle of Moscow conceptualists were unsatisfied because the members of this circle asked themselves a disturbing question. How does the art production of the unofficial Russian scene look in the international context? In emigration, um, artists were able to test firsthand how the sorts of projects that they had hitherto been mostly sharing in private would be received by non-Russian publics. And I hesitated to put this um, slide here. Indeed, I actually hesitated to talk about Russian art today. Um, but then I was interested um, that if you look, you've been probably looking at this list, and you know, here we have Russian artists being presented in New York under the heading of Eastern Europe. Um, so that's something we need to, I suppose, you know, think about. So in immigration, and this is what we're talking about here, is really the third wave, perhaps, of, um, of, uh, of Russian uh, emigre artists. Um, uh, and they're the Jewish generation um, who are moving after the change of laws in the second half of the 1970s. Um, this, uh, these artists um, soon found themselves mired in misunderstandings about politics. In some instances, uh, the new exchanges proved as troubling as the absence of wider feedback had once seemed to them. Margarita Tupitsin recalls that left critics and artists in New York were not prepared to embrace Soviet counterculture as a successor to the Russian avant-garde. Lucy Lippard's response to Rima and Valery Gerlovin's 1982 exhibition of Russian Samizdat art, uh, 1960 to 1982, uh, which they uh, put on at Franklin Furnace, um, will serve as my case study. The review that she wrote um, for the New York weekly Village Voice was ambivalent at best. If the cheerfully chaotic show, she wrote, sought to display a politics of neutrality bravely pursued amongst the ruins of a revolution, then Lippard noted that Pravda and posters of Lenin and workers taped to the floor were the only political gesture that she could discern. She commented on the hand-painted uh, banner welcoming visitors to uh, the first Russian vagabond reading room in the USA, 
and the childlike glee of projects such as Dmitry Prigov's telegrams from uh, Dostoevsky, uh, the sports committee of the USSR and God, and the pranks of the toadstools, such as riding the subways for 19 hours. Ultimately, though, Lippard felt that, quote, in the Tribeca context, it all looks rather quaint, even a bit precious, especially when compared with the latest oppositional art. Lippard argued that Sami's that art um, shares an image with much of the new wave. It is an image purportedly anti-ideological anti uh, anti in context, though in fact supporting the ideology of the status quo. While taking on the look of ideological art, lots of red and black banners, graffiti-like schools, an apolitical imitation of an earlier politicized tradition. According to Lippard, the exhibition propagated Quote, the myth of the artist as an enfant terrible. God forbid, she cautioned, that he or she, he grow up into a politically responsible person, in part because when she, he does, a lid is likely to be uh, clapped on her, his art in Reagan's increasingly anti-democratic America as well as in totally totalitarian Russia. She conceded, I know it's revolutionary in the Soviet Union to be apolitical, but I suspect neutrality is as much a myth there as it is here. Establishing a parallel between the cultural politics of the two Cold War adversaries, Lippard wrote that the KGB uh, recently searched the house and books of one of the Samizdat artists. The CIA has the largest library of left culture in the US. Reagan supports solidarity, uh, with capital S, Polish solidarity, as part of his anti-union red baiting and polarization program at home. In a world dominated by two superpowers, the Samis that show, she concluded, supports the right. Taking the opportunity to draw a straight parallel between the Russian artist's experience and the plight of the left-wing creative community in New York, as she saw it, she cited the Gerlovian's observation that the negative environment for free modern art has its sad but positive side. The forbidden fruit is sweet. The repressive social situation unites the art community inside. Lippard responded rhetorically, sound familiar? The review text um, entitled, um, after the quote from the Gerlovin's Forbidden Fruit, appeared in Village Voice, wrapped around an arresting illustration of an assemblage of folded Soviet and US newspapers, Pravda and the New York Times, topped by what the Gerlovins described in the catalogue as a paper mannequin uh, with the face of the author sitting amid a pile of books and newspapers. The image was an example of Anatol Ur's bookshelf theatre. But the village voice offered no caption or credit line to the artist. Uh, although the uh, author of the photo, of course, was credited. Uh, instead, the accompanying text ran, Russian Samizdat art at Franklin Furnace, tediously clever public nose tweaking. This rather insulting reference to the work as tediously clever ironically echoed the reference uh, to the work uh, as an adversarial in, uh, insult. Apparently that's what nose tweaking is. Aristocrats, if they wanted to start a duel, would poke the other person's nose. Something wonderful things you discover on the internet. Um, <laughs> uh, echoing this uh, reference to the work as an adversarial in insult, uh, referenced by Lucy Lippard scathingly. Um, yes, and presumably referencing this uh, out of date um, uh, insult. A fortnight later, uh, Village Voice uh, where uh, Lippard's re review had appeared, published um, two short responses by members of the Russian emigre artistic community in its letters section. 
the signatories of the first of these, um, Bagachanyan, Chernyshov, Goroshko, Sokov, Komar and Melamid, and Kuzminski, brackets, anarchist, uh, Nusberg, uh, Golovienko, and the Gerlovins, began. To those of us who have lived and struggled in the USSR, Lucy Lippard's article is reminiscent of the crude, cynical minds of petty Soviet bureaucrats. It surprises us that this highly reputed American political critic is so lacking in the most rudimentary aesthetic acumen. They wrote that the show at Franklin Furnace represented their moral and aesthetic indignation against the repression and destruction of the human spirit and explained that living under a totalitarian regime, Russian artists had to develop an alternative art language in order to avoid outright political persecution. They regretted that Miss Lippard has some difficulty in interpreting the artworks which grew out of political necessity and life experience, living as she does in bourgeois Soho. The authors vociferously protested against Lippard's claim that their work supports the right or status quo. These, they wrote, are outrageous allegations, considering that almost all the artists in this show have undergone um, personal persecution in the form of arrests, search, and threats from the authorities. They wished the reviewer the best of luck with her next grant application from the Reagan administration, which she presumably abhors, and pointed out that, quote, Russian artists are not funded for their underground activities. The participating artist's response uh, was followed by a second letter to the editor on the subject, this one by Margarita Tupitsin. Tupitsin praised um, the insights offered by Lippard, Lippard's review and listed a series of inaccuracies on the part of her compatriots. She challenged the Gerlovins' claim that there had been a negative environment for free modern art at the time of the development of the contemporary Russian avant-garde noting that in the mid-1970s, the social environment in Russia was quite favorable compared with earlier decades, and that there had been a new possibility to exhibit publicly. In response to which, she said, artistic life in Moscow showed remarkably new vigor. She also pointed to a misappropriation of the term samizdat in the show's title claiming that while there had been a good deal of important self-published poetry and dissident literature in the Soviet Union, there had been no more than a dozen artists in the visual camp of Samizdat, and that they never constituted a movement as such. Tupitsin proposed that the artists were fabricating a movement and overstating the case in relation to the severity of the cultural situation in the USSR, thereby publicly aligning herself with Lippard. If Lippard had provided the um, artists involved in the Russian Samizdat show with a set of replies to their question of how the unofficial art scene looked in an international context, the work was quaint, their show was on the right, and they had some growing up to do, uh, then Tupitsin put the nail in the coffin proposing that even from a Russian perspective, the show lacked authentic art historical credentials. Nadim Saman, who wrote his PhD on the reception of Russian art in um, New York, supervised by uh, Sarah Wilson at the Courtauld, has noted that in all likelihood it was um, in part because of stiff competition between the emigre artists um, that it was this stiff competition that led to this sort of, as he very politely puts it, less than cordial behavior. As I hope this example illustrates, it seems to have been remarkably difficult for artists and critics to build on common ground in the late Cold War period. The sometimes patronizing tone of Lippard's review and the anger expressed by the artists in response reveal the ways in which the disagreements in the grassroots sphere uh, often echoed uh, in inverted form the superpower politics of those times. We are all at different points in our social aesthetic histories, explained Lippard. 
Understanding um, each other's needs is a necessity for any kind of cultural internationalism, she wrote, um, and she proposed that analyzing these contradictions might be as fruitful as, as resolving them is forbidden. The argument that artists from different nation states or different Cold War blocs were at different points, though, I think, had a developmentalist ring to it. Lippard mobilized temporality within a framework of cultural difference, which made the status of the Russian emigre artists unclear. On the one hand, she seemed to imply that having left Russia, they no longer qualified as properly Russian. And on the other hand, um, she clearly didn't see their work as belonging to the same point um, as that of her own New York circle. By contrast, um, and I suppose it relates to, um, to Gabriela's presentation on time yesterday uh, too, Susan Buck Morse has argued um, for the critical importance of recognizing a shared time. She points out that, quote, there is no part of a global space that is advanced in time, none that is backward. We are all in this time that is both transient and universal. We share the same contingent history. In the 1980s, Lippard uh, was also seeking to claim that in spite of immense differences in culture, age, or style, artists are uniting again around the world situation. Echoing some of uh, her earlier claims uh, for cultural workers as being at the forefront of the struggle against alienation. The uniting artists to whom Lippard referred were, she wrote, searching desperately for a constructive base on which to build a culture that is not only oppositional, but whole and human as well. Lippard opened her 1982 review by joking, my only credentials for writing about Russian art is that I am occasionally called a Stalinist by those who don't know from Stalinism. By those who do, I'm called either a hopeless liberal or a dupe. Perhaps it's no wonder then that Lippard read the Russian works in terms of left and right. But in doing so, she rather missed the point. These handmade books and installations were anti-technocratic, I want to argue, through and through. They rejected the political terms of the Cold War era. Slavoj Žižek, um, who in fact occasionally claims himself to be a Stalinist, um, once schematized this sort of misunderstanding very well. He wrote, the basic misunderstanding, the lack of communication between the Western left and the dissidents of late socialism, it is as if, uh, yeah, that's what he writes about. And he says, um, it is as if it were forever impossible for them to find a common language. Although they felt they should somehow be on the same side, an elusive gap seemed forever to separate them. For Western leftists, Eastern dissidents were all too naive in their belief in democracy, in their rejection of socialism. They threw out the baby with the bathwater. In the eyes of the dissidents, the Western left played patronizing games with them, disavowing the true harshness of the totalitarian regime. Although Lippard saw Russian Samizdat art of the 1980s as insufficiently constructive, it was not the case that the artist in the show had no interest in promoting a whole and human uh, culture. The difference was one of approach. Um, Rima Gerlovina's six-foot sculpture poem, Interchangeable Man, installed in the show, took the form of a human shape divided into a series of boxes to be filled with text-bearing soft cubes, which the artist explained addressed a range of concepts from positive to negative meaning. For example, rational, realistic, normal, queer, abnormal, crazy. Through the cubes, it's possible to trace the line, she said, from genius to stupid, from saint to devil, and so on. 
the spectator has the opportunity to rearrange the cubes. The work is based on the paradox that while man is a process of fate, he can overcome that process through well-directed personal effort. Gerlovina's seriously ironic piece was an interactive demonstration of human potentialities, offering spectators the opportunity to play at constructing their own holistic vision of a man. What was Gerlovina's piece if not a participatory reflection on the constructed nature of a predefined vision of the wholly human? To suggest that the work was somehow apolitical um, was really beside the point. Uh, its postmodern human uh, a humor uh, required a more philosophical approach on the part of the viewer. I suspect that when at the opening of the Franklin Furnace show, the Gerlovins showered visitors with handbills offering, quote, the compressed Russian spirit concentrated in a black square suitable for transplant, unquote, they were not so much resurrecting the spirit of the Soviet avant-garde as reminding New York visitors of the extent to which the American version of modernism was founded on Russian myths sustained and nourished by way of international transplants. A critic for the Washington Post uh, who reviewed a later iteration of, Russian Samizdat, of the Russian Samizdat show observed that a yearning to communicate pervades all these works. He had identified the key problem. Uneven flows of information across the Iron Curtain doubtless played some part in these artistic misunderstandings. It was a question addressed eloquently in an exhibition installation project by the Hungarian artist Georg Galantai in 1984. The theme of the exhibition uh, was Hungary Can Be Yours, International Hungary, and the exhibition space of the Young Artists Club in, in Budapest had been divided uh, into two discrete zones. The diagram explains there was one-way communication by video between the two rooms. In the black room, foreign countries, that was in the basement, um, Yes, one could look at the program transmitted from the white room, uh, Hungary. In the black room, uh, the sound component consisted in a program on Hungary from the Finnish radio, and in the white room, the audio consisted in songs of the communist movement. Foreign artists then could both see into the Hungarian room and hear information about the country and listen to communist music, while the Hungarians were unable to access any information from outside, and their experience was limited to exchanges among their own circle of Hungarian artists, or at least this is the kind of performative dichotomy that the exhibition sets up. Galantai had been subjected to serious repression at the hands of the authorities following the forced closure of the Balaton Bogra Chapel studio in 1973, and his melancholic version of international relations revealed the complexities of working across the Iron Curtain in those times. And yet there was also a great desire to communicate, and those who could, uh, and, and there were also those uh, who could see beyond uh, the political divide. Theodore Rorschach's uh, classic of 1969, The Making of a Counterculture, Reflections on the Technocratic Society and its Youthful Opposition, was significant in this respect, in my view. Rorschach argued that the superpower ideologies were a political diversion. Capitalism and communism were two sides of the same technocratic coin. He wrote, technocracy is not the exclusive product of that old devil capitalism, rather it is the product of a mature and accelerating industrialism. The American historian defined technocracy as, quote, that social form in which an industrial society reaches the peak of its organizational integration. He, uh, so he wrote, is it left wing or right wing? Is it liberal or reactionary? Is it a vice of capitalism or socialism? The answer is, it is none of these. 
the experts are no longer part of such, uh, uh, of such po political dichotomies. Their stance is that of men who have risen above ideology. They talk of facts and probabilities and practical solutions. Their politics is the technocracy. The making of a counterculture focused on the predicament of technocracy's children, whose commitment to the personal and the culture of disaffiliation united what Rorschach called the mind-blown bohemianism of the beats and hippies on the one hand and the hard-headed political activism of the student new left. The author was sensitive to the difficulties faced by these alienated incorrigibles, whom he described as restless, bewildered, hungry for better ideas, and fluctuating between turning political and dropping out. But he also identified certain structural problems relating first to the limited capacity for active solidarity between the countercultural young and the wretched of the earth. And second, uh, the problem of the drift towards commercialization. These were for Rorschach uh, the counterculture's twin perils. On the one hand, the weakness of its cultural rapport with the disadvantaged, and on the other, its vulnerability to exploitation as an amusing sideshow of the swinging society. Rorschach's concern with impediments to solidarity among different groups and with the co-opting of the alternative uh, by the market. And his analysis of the counterculture's juggling of the personal and the political, I think offers a valuable paradigm for discussing the cultural politics of alternative art in the late Cold War period. I want to argue that countercultures and alternative art histories are best viewed as part of a shared anti-technocratic project if productive exchange is rarely without its misunderstandings, the glitches in communication are worth lingering over. The search for alternatives within the framework of systems in which the official line seems to be that there is no alternative is as relevant today as it was at the height of the Cold War in the insanity of a world order structured around mutually assured uh, destruction. As living memories of actually existing socialism begin to fade, and as new generations seek fresh ways to invent alternatives to capitalism and or socialism, uh, seeking to understand and theorize the history of missed opportunities for understanding among potentially like-minded alternative people seems pressing. Conceptually oriented projects intended to circulate beyond a local setting help us to think further about these and by extension about the potential for and impediments to finding common ground among artists and thinkers today as we continue to grapple with different accounts of historical developments and try to find ways of working together in polarized times. The many decades of Cold War division and disinformation uh, fuel war and misunderstandings to this day. The questions around art and politics raised by the 1980s Village Voice debate still matter because artists and citizens um, from across the contemporary incarnations of what Lepard called 30 years ago anti-democratic America and totally totalitarian Russia are still looking for alternatives. A Russian translation of Rorschach's book appeared in 2014. The book is also enjoying something of a comeback in Europe uh, right now, signaled by the publication of a new French translation last year. Its tone is both optimistic and apocalyptic. Dissenting young people are the matrix, Rorschach wrote, in which an alternative but still excessively fragile future is taking shape. This alternative, he felt, was all we have to hold against the final consolidation of a technocratic totalitarianism in which we find ourselves ingeniously adapted to an existence wholly estranged from everything that has ever made the life of man an interesting adventure. Thank you. And I encourage you all to read the book. It's a really good book. Thank <laughs> you.